hello can everyone hear me yes. right brilliant i think i lost you yes. all for a second there apologies but i'm back um apologies for that my zoom kind of had a bit of a hiccup um so as i was saying if you're going to ask a question please use the chat function um but when we come to ask a question please make sure if you are happy to that your camera is on because it would be great to see you so apologies for that slight gremlins in the works but uh, without further ado let's move on to our first speaker he's going to talk about data security and privacy in the new world of cloud Paul McCormack is founder and CEO of Corman and advisor to Projectory. Um, Project Paul is a solicitor and attorney specializing across data privacy, cybersecurity, and digital technology. And he's working with Cormoon, it's a technology development business helping companies to navigate the complexity of the laws and also working to enable the use of data in a compliant and secure manner. He's a regular speaker on data protection, digital and cybersecurity related issues. And it's great to have you with us representing both Corman and Projectory. So Paul, over to you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Sue, thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I hope this will be uh, a sort of an interesting and, and to the extent we can make this engaging um, and interactive session. Uh, it'd be great to obviously have questions as we go through the topic because it's quite a broad, broad area and some, something that obviously is very close to um, the areas that we, we, we work across from, from a Cormian perspective um, and also from a Protegrity perspective. Um, but really what, what we want to talk about today is data security and privacy in the new world of cloud. Um, so as I was thinking about this, this topic ahead of um, today's deep dive, I was sort of thinking about, you know, really what, what do we mean by the new world of cloud? And, uh, you know, fundamentally cloud in itself, um, as the, those on a call will have different perspectives, but certainly the, the definition of cloud is pretty well known and, and understood as we, as we sort of sit here today. Um, but I guess really w when we think about this sort of new world of cloud, um, the question that sort of arose to me was, is this a new world? Is this a new concept that we're grappling with? What, what is the new concept? What are the issues um, when considering the cloud? And certainly in the context of security versus privacy. So what I'd like to sort of explore today is the, the, the differences of those um, different considerations from, from a technical and from a legal perspective um, and, and, and sort of uh, hopefully help navigate what certainly what we see in the context of uh, adoption of cloud, migration to cloud, or, or further continued use of that. So, you know, fundamentally, I mean, again, cloud itself, I think we can all agree is not necessarily a new concept, it's not necessarily a new technology. It's been in existence for, for, for some years. And the phrase coined by, by Eric Schmidt, allegedly back in sort of 2006, it's been around for for a while, uh, but I think really where well we're seeing that sort of new era of cloud, I guess, is the the the, va the vast adoption and reliance, I guess, that cloud um, organizations are placing upon cloud to enable um, business activities, use of data to happen in a more efficient, cost-effective, and scalable manner. So we look at the different versions of cloud, whether it's infrastructure, platform or software. Um, and, and, and we're obviously seeing it even today. So, you know, the, the fact we're all virtually connected through Zoom um, and, you know, the, the sort of, I suppose this era now where we, we, we're moving towards this work from anywhere concept. We're, we're thinking about um, technologies very, very differently. And I think that I'm sure most in the call will have experienced um, you know, the, the, the new or enhanced ways of working, but also the enhanced ways of communicating um, via technologies that support this, which are typically cloud-based solutions, uh, one to many multi-tenanted environments that, that can offer us um, can, can offer us some, some sort of specific uh, activities around that. So I, th I think, you know where we where we get to with this, we end up in a position where cloud in itself has become a, a necessary tool, um, and a, I suppose this new world of thinking about cloud as a as a fundamental pillar of enablement of um, business operate effectively. 
so that sort of obviously leads us through and i think you know, many will be familiar obviously with with zoom that we're on today the the, the question marks of privacy and security of, of zoom and you know, i think when communication started happening across this as as, as covid um uh, escalated and we started to see uh, lots of news stories come out about um, the security of of Zoom. Um, that and, and by no means do I think that that is um, specific to to Zoom. I think it's an inherent uh, challenge that every cloud vendor has got, but and every user of cloud has got. But I think what what it heightened to me was the fact that um, most uh, individuals, consumers of the solution. Um, and now faced with considerations around privacy and security, and, and certainly it's, it's even more heightened because of the increased use of this. And when we come to, I guess, thinking about this, we think about what, what are the trade-offs? How do we think about grappling with security versus privacy versus performance? So in essence, you know, security being how do we ensure that the intruders externally, internally, et cetera, don't unnecessarily or unlawfully or without permission gain access to the underlying assets, the underlying data. Um, Hi, sorry, I, I, I don't want to budge in, but could I please? Hello? Yes, hello. Hello, hi, hi uh, the organizer. Could you please uh, mute all of us apart from the speaker? Because I think we are listening to two different conversations here. Okay, apologies for this, everybody. Um, I will make sure that happens, but if everybody could go on mute as well. Um, so, uh, ah. yeah, ap apologies for that. Um, that should be fine now, um, Paul. Thank you for raising that. Um, Paul, please go ahead. But any other problems, please do raise them in the chat. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Well, look, um, just, just to sort of, I guess, start that, what I was talking about there again, I mean, when we think about security and privacy um, in the context of the cloud, what, what always springs to mind for, for certainly the, the, the lens that we have into the space is there is always trade-offs. You, you cannot have a 100% a secure environment whilst also having complete performance. Um, if you, and I think a lot of this comes down to really, you know, what, what information are you putting onto the cloud? What are you thinking about using the cloud for, and you've got to think about security um, in tandem with privacy, in tandem with, with performance. And I think where I get to with that is, you know, the, the sort of thought process around, is it security and privacy as a complete bucket versus performance? And, and how do you calibrate yourself? So what, when you're actually thinking about usage of the cloud, um, you are appropriately calibrating security depending on the actual risks that present and and likewise for privacy. So thinking about, you know, what are the risks associated with leveraging cloud-based solutions or cloud-based infrastructure, um, and how how do you appropriately manage those risks to enable performance, to enable the usage of data? And I think this this sort of leads, I guess, into to the space of what are those risks? What are the different? And let's start off with privacy. What are the privacy risks? associated with um, the use of any form of technology, cloud being one of those. Um, obviously, we've got competing laws, regulations around the world which talk to this. Uh, we're all familiar with, with GDPR, for example, but when we look across the globe, there's, there's new and emerging laws happening across uh, Africa, across India, across China, across the US. So it is a, an evolving landscape that, that has been in existence for a number of years you know, in, in Europe, obviously dating back to the 1995 European Data Protection Directive, um, but obviously it's been evolved further because of GDPR and, and we're seeing, I suppose, the, the domino effect of regulators around the world um, across the Middle East, for example, um, I, I, introducing new laws and regulations to, to manage this. So I think when, when it comes to, to me, when it comes to privacy risks, I tried to try and I've distilled this down into to this uh, fractal triangle to, to, to illustrate to some extent where we can look at the different issues that present itself to manage those privacy risks or security risks. Um, and I think obviously there's different ways that people will slice and dice 
um, those risks and how you manage privacy and security in the cloud or, or in any environment. But I think fundamentally, the same issues typically present themselves, but in, in is how you apply those rules or how you apply those requirements or how you introduce those controls that I think is the essential aspect when it comes to consideration of, of a safe and secure manner to use a cloud whilst also addressing the privacy risks. And we'll come on to the security risks in a, in a few moments. Um, so I think when, when we're thinking about, say, the legal risk, for example, contractual risks present itself or contractual requirements to manage legal risks are always going to be there when, especially when engaging third parties. So, you know, obviously in the cloud space, we, we, we know that most um, cloud service providers will have a one-to-many um, cloud services agreement. And that typically is drafted in a way to ensure that um, like the solution itself being a one-to-many solution, the contract itself is one-to-many. So you know that you know, it's, it's very difficult to amend those terms because it's been structured in that way so that um, all users are, are in the same, uh, same basis. Uh, but obviously there are different legal requirements that need to go into there, into the contract itself. Um, we think about impact assessments and uh, not, not least from the recent um, uh, European decision to render the US um, privacy shield invalid following TRIMS 2. Um, historically, we've, you know, over the past couple of years, we've, we've become familiar with the concept of data protection impact assessments. But now this concept of um, data transfer impact assessments is also real and present as a result of um, the, the concerns around where data is going to. And obviously lawfulness of data, how do you ensure that what you're using the data for in the environment um, meets the relevant requirements as it relates to the use of personal data? So I think as we sort of move through, you know, obviously there's, there's technical considerations as well, security, um, data security, physical security, uh, access requirements, and, and also thinking as well about how can you take some of these requirements and also make it a, a business um, benefit or certainly use privacy enhancing technology to uh, enable the, the secure uh, and safe and compliant usage of data um, when certainly leveraging the power of the cloud can present. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll touch briefly on governance, because I think answering the whole thing are how do you ensure that policy procedures are introduced internally? Because it's not just simply um, an external piece of pushing the responsibilities onto a cloud service provider. It's thinking about the whole holistic, you know, where's data is going to and from. Um, and I, th I think, Sorry, I think there was a question in the chat. Uh, no, I think that's fine. I think I think we're okay with the the sound, Sue. Is everyone, everyone hear me okay? Everything is fine, Paul. You're doing great. Good, excellent, perfect. Technology is working well today. So I think um, when it comes to governance, we think about policies, procedures. We think about the roles and responsibilities, and really trust and verification, so audit and assurance. How do you ensure that what you are putting in, in a contract, for example, is being appropriately addressed? How do you ensure that the lawful requirements that are imposed upon you, in any case of using the information, are being appropriately managed and addressed? And, and we'll, we'll touch briefly on that towards the end, but really where, where I wanna focus on, on now is, you know, who, who owns the risk? Who, who's accountable for that risk? Um, and why does then this balance between security, privacy, and performance um, become even more important when it comes to leveraging third-party solutions or, or, or cloud solutions? Um, I think obviously we can agree that you know, risk ownership, certainly when it comes to data, will always reside with the, you know, certainly in a personal data context, the controller of that data. Um, that that risk is is still the same if it's non-personal data. So any whoever is a, effectively the owner of that data uh, runs at risk. But when you transfer that out, when you delegate the the responsibility out to a third party, is how do you ensure that the risk itself is being appropriately delegated? How do you manage that risk and ensure that it can be done in a controlled manner and in a secure manner? Um, and obviously, we we talked about the legal aspects to that. And there's is more complexity, I think, as you 
dive into the legal considerations around the contract, the impact assessment and lawfulness. And we can, we can kind of see that on things that you would always want to see in a contract when it comes to uh, managing the privacy risk. And I think those sort of things are data protection obligations. And typically most cloud service providers, and certainly when you look across the standard terms for Azure or Amazon Web Service or Google Cloud um, and other providers out there, by design, they, they incorporate these obligations that are set forth by the, the GDPR, for example. So Article 28, data protection obligations, um, sorry, data process obligations, they're, they're incorporated. Um, security of processing, contractually, they're typically incorporated. But obviously, what security means um, for organizations may depend upon, obviously, the asset that you talk about. What is this, the sensitivity of that data? And obviously, the international transfers is a, is a hot topic at the moment. So I know that within the conference uh, today, there is a discussion around, uh, obviously, the SHREMS 2 decision and, and what that means for international transfers, and in particularly in the context of transfers happening from within the European economic area to the US. And obviously, you know, we're seeing further guidance come out from the European re regulators uh, imminently. Um, but that means that as you sort of move towards the bottom part of the triangle on the slide, impact assessments become even more important when considering the legal risks. So have you carried out your data protection impact assessment on the data that's going to go out there when it's personal data? Have you now considered a transfer impact assessment post REMS 2? Um, what, what is the jurisdiction where the data will reside or, or jurisdictions? Uh, and then finally, you know, would you need to consider a legitimate interest assessment as well? Is, is the, the lawful basis upon which you're using data is a legitimate interest? And do you need to consider if that's appropriately been, been assessed? And then finally, the, the sort of bottom right of the triangle, we think about lawfulness as a whole. So, you know, have you managed the conditions of processing? What are the rights to those individuals? And have you ensured fair notice to individuals? So all, all of these things are not new. And I think the, what I'm trying to um, represent by the triangle and, and represent by ex describing it in this way is that I think that the same rules apply. It's just simply how to uh, allocate the responsibility because of a third party typically helping and supporting with that. And, and equally, and, and often the case, I think, you know, when it comes to things like security, um, part of the benefit, the, the, the power of cloud is that often you can uh, increase your, your security capabilities and, and privacy capabilities because of the tooling that is available when migrating across. So, so there's a significant privacy benefit by going, but obviously it comes with risk and, and ensuring that you are aware of what the legal requirements might be and how to manage that. So I guess to, to, just to move on a little bit further, uh, and I want to talk just briefly now about security. Um, and, and this was a sort of the technical aspect that I, I sort of mentioned before. And when we come to security, that there's, there's obviously different ways to um, uh, consider that. I think you know part of that is thinking about the, the different elements of security. And in the context of cloud or an on-premise solution, uh, you, you've obviously got the different layers of security the external layers and the internal layers. And I think when it comes to thinking about how to manage the actual assets you have fundamentally, um, again, it depends upon obviously what cloud service you're procuring. Perhaps you're procuring a platform service or a software as a service. So some of this may be built into the package that you're, you're obtaining. So, so actually understanding what elements of that um, will be obviously very important depending on you know, sophistication of, of um, organizations, teams. Um, it may be that a lot of the aspects of this you're able to manage in-house. Other aspects you, you, you'll benefit from, from the power that some of the cloud service providers can actually offer to, to address these sorts of things. Um, but sort of going down, you know, the different layers of security, perimeter, network, endpoint security, application security, and then finally data security. The way that we, we think about this often um, certainly from a protector perspective and a Cormier perspective is, 
it's thinking about actually what is the actual asset you are worried about how do you ensure data centricity when it comes to security because you can have the you know the, the outer perimeter secure but how do you manage what happens is someone gets through the the, 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 you know, the hard app, you ensure you're managing the insider risks. Um, and, and one way of thinking about this um, is perhaps more data-centric approach to security. So queuing data, and certainly censored data by protecting the data itself. So protecting the entire data flow at rest in transit and in use, applying security as close to the data as possible, delivering centralized policy enforcement across the enterprise to manage that. I think where, where we sort of lead ourselves to then is a an approach and you know we're really great to to as we conclude this part of the presentation to understand issues views that, that those on the call <clears throat> might have around this area um, but the way that we would typically look at it from a methodology perspective when trying to manage all that myriad of different requirements different rules different obligations is to think about really fundamentally what data do you have? The discovery of data. Um, do you know what data you've got within the organization? Is it personal data? Is it other data? Is it confidential data? Once you know what you've got, you can classify the data. You can come up with or apply your existing internal data classification policies and procedures around that data. But f fundamentally understanding what classifications you need to apply and, and what controls then would be applicable to that category of data governance thinking about the internal policies the external contracts to ensure that the relevant classification of data is appropriately managed uh, protection ensuring that obviously the data itself then is protected in accordance with the the classification of data um, enforcement of that and, and finally monitoring of that um, and i think this this sort of perhaps way of looking at this is certainly how a lot of organizations do look at it already. It's certainly the way we, we try to ensure that this, the, the complexity of the legal, the technical, the governance aspects are, are managed effectively. Um, and then we move into a space where a lot of these sorts of issues are addressed. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pause there, and I, I can see that a couple of questions are coming through in the chat. But really that, that those concepts, I hope that was, of use for, for on the call today. I know we're, we're coming close to the, the end of um, uh, the allocated time for, for me today. Um, but perhaps, Sue, if we can just pause there and open up for, for questions. Um, I know there is already one in the chat about how about user-centric security. Yeah, do you want to take that one, Paul, to kick us off perhaps? Sure, sure. I think that's from, from Ralph. So Ralph, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 think, I think it's a, very interesting point. I think, you know, use centricity as well as data centricity, I, I guess it comes down to what risks you are looking at. But I think it's a really important aspect as well as focusing on the data to look at the you know, user centricity, I guess, as well. Um, you know, my, my view on that is that that absolutely is an important aspect when thinking about, you know, access to data roles, um, profiles, for example, um, and ensuring that you are uh, applying uh, access to data as it relates to to different profiles of users. Um, if, if I sort of understand what you're talking about there, Ralph, in terms of user centricity of, of security, I, I assume by that your, your sort of question there relates specifically around those sorts of, uh, you know, certainly access management and um, profiles of users is that what you're talking about or is that your question Ralph please feel free to come off mute if you'd like to um, add anything else from from your question perhaps perhaps that was it Paul perhaps you've um, answered it you nailed it <laughs> yeah Ralph go ahead okay um, um so so my my um my impression about this thing is um that you that you're trying to get away from the uh, machine centric uh, um, security that we have been doing 
uh, for uh, for decades, um, and that probably data is better um, starting point than machines. Um, so th this is this is where. But, but if you look at the big, at bigger pictures, um, what what's driving businesses is their business continuity and their workflows. Uh, within and uh, and um, in this in, in this concept, data is just one uh, one um, part uh, in the image, um, and users is the others. But there are, um, are uh, many different uh, aspects, and users pop up in my mind first. But if you if you look look into look look at this bigger picture uh, thingy, then. Um, um, then uh, data is probably not the right starting point. It's it's probably better than than the, the machine uh, than than the starting point with protecting machines. But but um, pro but there may be other points of view. So that's you know, basically it. No, it's I definitely it's complex, right, Paul? There's definitely lots of different elements that the organisations need to think about. I suppose user centric as well as as consumers or users it's it's your employees as well in terms of um endpoints as well right i com completely agree completely agree and i think i think you know the the data interesting view that we were taking there was was more more of the lens i think to to what ralph you were talking about there about you know, machines and generally it's to ensure that we can move away from a point of um uh, being fixed to one technology it's, it's ensuring being technology neutral or agnostic so it makes things more fluid so you can actually migrate from an on-premise solution to a cloud solution because actually you're tracking and securing the data itself rather than the the environment around that data um, and, and that's part of the you know the benefit i guess when when thinking about data centricity um, or data centric security that you focus on the data rather than the environment and that makes you know, migration easier smoother um, but uh, uh, absolutely, I think to, to your point, Sue, I think you know, there are different competing elements of play. I think user security is always going to be a relevant factor, particularly that insider threat, um, ensuring that you know, you're managing that risk appropriately. But this is you know, what we're talking about here, really, I guess, is, is you know, that, that the ability to leverage data um, and, and think about the performance angle of things without necessarily inhibiting um, you know, what technology you're looking to leverage that on. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Ralph, for your question. We are, apologies, we're running very quickly out of time. And thank you for putting your camera as well. Great to see you. Hi. Um, we've got uh, a couple of questions in the chat, um, Paul. So I'm going to be a horrible chair and perhaps group some of these together uh, just so that we can make sure we answer. So Tim was, um, Tim Wagner, do you consider transparency a valid pillar of security, um, showing the effect of people every um, access manipulation of their data? And then we had a, a, a question from Nazmus about how do human factors such as potential risks with data leaks with employees at home during COVID lockdown, are they taken into consideration when thinking about data security? I think we kind of touched on that just then around um, user-centric and protecting the endpoints as well, but perhaps want to just touch on that. And it's the shift from a, a parameter-centric um, security mm -hmm. to a data-centric security uh, as a move towards zero trust. I suppose that's that's a, a statement, um, but I, I think what you're saying is you would agree on that. Um, so just wondered whether you could, in a couple of minutes, just reflect on those, and then we will have to bring the session to an end. But Paul, um, perhaps just... Of course. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And th thanks everyone for the for the for the engaging questions. This is it's very interesting. I, I think that you know, touching on the first couple of points there um, about transparency as a valid pillar of security, so showing the effect of people every access manipulation of the data. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you know, this is part of that transparency is, is I think such an important point, not least for 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 legal reasons, but. I think to, to the point you're talking about there about uh, it goes into trust as well, trust and confidence about um, how do you ensure that if data is accessible, certainly on the cloud service product side, um, you know about it as the as the consumer, as the actual owner, the responsible party. So when you share that risk, um, uh, you've got visibility of, of of what's actually happening with that data. So I think you know transparency is 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 indeed. A valid pillar is i think it's an essential pillar um to 
to, to maintain um, appropriate allocation of responsibilities. But ultimately, when it comes to governance, how can you deal with that um, trust and verify? So, you know, whilst you might trust, you need to obviously verify audit and assurance checks about what's happening. So I think that's an excellent question. Um, and I'm conscious uh, uh, time, so I'll, I'll be brief on, on the final couple of points. I think you know, human factors we've, we've, we've already touched on um, and I think, you know, in terms of risks of data leakage at home, I, I think to me, a lot, a lot of those sorts of human factor risks and issues clearly have always been there. I think it's heightened when it comes to home working, you know, other physical and, and digital access to data. So hard copies, soft copies, that sort of thing. But just generally, I think it's a, you know, a more of a real and present issue for companies that have had to grapple with that. Um, and I think, you know, the, the sort of data interesting view on on security can help with that um but i, th I, I think uh, i think it was thorsten's comment i think is a is a very good one and i i agree with that that you know it is it is moving towards that zero trust um so i think uh, uh, overall I, th I think that hope hopefully that answers those questions <laughs> i think so paul you've done brilliantly thank you Great. so much and um Pleasure. i think on behalf of everybody thank you so much for that uh really insightful and in-depth presentation and particularly given the the, the technical gremlins so uh, uh well done uh, i know it's 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 hard when things like that happen so you were absolute pro so thank you paul mccormack Pleasure. so much that was fascinating and really brilliant to have you with us and i'm sure um if we were in a room you would get a um, thunderous round of applause so thank you paul so much brilliant there you go brilliant to have you with us thank you Thanks paul you. um and i hope you can um, stick around for our next speaker but a pleasure to have you with us so thank you so much for that um, brilliant presentation uh, right we we now move on to our next speaker which um uh, which is brilliant to have um, with us as well as paul just um sorts out his screen um so next we're going to be talking about technology as a binding element of data security and data protection um with dr valdemar gruzin expert um director for core se and i think dr grunzin is with us um I, I i think if he could just come off mute are you with us i am here brilliant hi lovely to meet you thank you so much for being with us uh really looking forward to your presentation and thank you for being with us um, at the deep dive stage today at the Bitcom Privacy Conference. But though, just before we start, uh, Dr. Guzine, I'll, I'll just give a, a bit of housekeeping to everybody because some people may have just only joined us. So uh, welcome. If you have, it's great to have you with us. If you could just make sure that you are all on mute so we can just minimize any background noise. Any other sound gremlins or anything, please drop me a message on the chat function and we'll, we'll soon sort that out. And also, if you have a question for this next session, please um, share that or any comments in the chat and I can check the box and, and invite you to ask the questions and we should have some time at the end of the presentation. But please remember your, your name will be displayed um, when you ask a question or a comment in the chat function and this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the YouTube, Bitcom YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, so without further ado, um, if you're ready, um, Dr. Gruzine, I'm going to hand over to you um, to take us through uh, your presentation on technology as a binding right. element of data security and data privacy. Thank you, Sue. I will try to share my screen now. Okay. And your sound is a little low, so I don't know if you're able. Now. That's better now. Is Thank better you. Now? Okay. So I have to keep the mic <laughs> at my face and wait a moment. Now it should be the best mode you have now. Okay. Perfect. Over to you. Okay, you see it. Okay, let us come to my first slide. Maybe a first small introduction. I'm working with Core for the last four and a half years. Core is an IT think tank, as you can see, and we concentrate for technology transformation with a regional focus on the gas region and the Gulf region, so a little bit separated from each other. We develop strategies, applications, and systems and implement them on request. We can also operate these IT systems on-premise, but maybe it's better to do it now on clouds as we have uh, here at 
some minutes ago. I, for myself, I have a doctorate in electrical engineering and a master of business administration. My focus now is on data protection and information security and the regulation of these two areas. I'm working as an operational ISO, that means an information security officer, and as a DPO, that means a data protection officer. At some customers at the time, they vary, uh, vary from, let me say, 20 staff members up to 3,000 staff members. Uh, and I, I develop both management systems, that means an ISMS and an PIMS, and if desired, bring the customers even through an ISA audit, for example, a 27001 audit. Before core, I worked for private banks and there on all aspects of online banking and card payment schemes, and above all on the security of these two topics. And below, right on this slide, you can see my last three projects at core. So that was my small introduction. On the next slide, you see that technology is the simultaneous key to enabling digitization, ensuring privacy and protecting against cybersecurity threats. As we are with Bitcom today, according to a Bitcom survey from the last year, the average damage per cybersecurity incident was 4.3 million euros, 4.3 million euros on average. And if personal data such as credit card data is damaged in such incidents, the damage can increase further as a result of a fine imposed by the Data Protection Supervisory Authority and claims for damages by the data subject by the people concerned. As you can see, technology is the key to protecting information and personal data and to shaping the path towards the unavoidable digitization. We cannot avoid it, we should go for it. So that means technology is a combination of the three aspects, data protection, cybersecurity, and digitization itself in the magic circle. The next slide, challenges in implementing data protection requirements are often based on mis misperceptions. Um, the first one, firstly, there is nothing wrong with the world of law. It's a very exciting area, but it is also data protection and the GDPR. It's seen too much through the lens of paragraphs from my point of view. The world is going online. Uh, the world is becoming more digital. Software is eating the world. Data is on the net. Technology has taken over, so data protection must also be seen from a technical perspective. In the second row, data protection can already be automated in many applications scenarios by using modern IT and modern IT infrastructures. Think of a simple office suite. Everything there is processed and can be automatically prepared for data protection purposes. In this respect, not everything in data protection has to be customized again and again from the scratch. Think about policies and processes, which can be standardized and even automated with the help of technology. And thirdly, last but not least, data protection is not only a cost factor, but on the contrary, a competitive factor, as you will see in the following. Two pages ago, I explained that the modern IT infrastructure provides better protection against cybersecurity incidents and thus leads to a higher level of data protection. You know that the GDPR is the first data protection law in the world to include the words protection through the use of technology and even the word encryption in the legal text. And data protection have, laws have been around for 50 years. You may know that the first data protection law was launched in 1970 in Hesia, in the Bundesland Hesia. So coming back to the GDPR, 24 of the 99 articles for the GDPR directly or indirectly describe the use of technology. And central to this is Article 32, which is called Security of Processing, which describes all technical and organizational measures, the so-called TOM, that are required 
for technical and organizational data protection and can be mapped by an information security management system, an ISMS. And an ISMS is the best basis for a privacy information management system, a PIMS. So in the following, I will show you how they help the, how the technology help to fulfill the Tom using the three examples, success control, the A here, cryptography and pseudonymization. We will start with access control. Access control is uh, to infrastructures, to systems, and to applications is probably the most powerful TOM, T O M, in information security and therefore also in data protection. This TOM consists of many tools, which I categorized here on the slide into baseline and into additional tools. The basis is an identity direct directory, an ID, for example, an AD. Uh, in the case of Microsoft uh, Azure Directory, Active Directory, sorry, Microsoft Azure Active Directory is very famous. On which, for example, an SSO and single sign on and network security groups can be built. The basis tools can all be implemented on premise, of course, and in the cloud. However, clouds offer additional tools that cannot be built on premise. Examples are conditional access cloud-specific policies, security policies, time-based access control, various dashboards that even give advice on how to increase the level of data security and privacy and cloud-exclusive risk tools. Access control in one sentence means uh, on-premise you can do a lot, but in the cloud you can do more and easier and therefore more secure. The next slide deals with cryptography. Cryptography uh, is a well-known topic. Everybody is talking about cryptography, and that's right. But it's nothing new since Bruce Schneier, Bruce Schneier, one of the famous cryptographers, stands for the S in the RSA algorithm, introduced SMA symmetric cryptography in the 1970s of the last century. The grant was prepared by Bruce Schneier for the use of cryptography on the internet. Until then, the symmetric key had to be distributed laboriously, uh, which is not a method for large distributed networks like the internet. Strictly speaking, cryptography consists only of four methods, four methods for the whole internet. And these are, the four methods are the digital signature, the message authentication codes, a MAC, known as a MAC, the symmetric and the asymmetric encryption, that's all. Hashing works with and without a key, only the key variant could be named cryptography. And pseudonymization is not part of cryptography, but it's getting more and more important for the new requirements in data protection, as we will see later. A short summary to cryptography. Cryptography is well researched and available at standard tools like libraries, like meshes, and in integrated development environments, IDEs. Cryptography has been proven to be applicable. The only thing that is important for data protection with cryptography is the protection of the confidentiality. These are the red rectangles here. However, cryptography cannot solve a central problem in data protection. End-to-end um, -end encryption and point-to-point -point encryption, P2P, help against compromised systems and attackers in your own network during data transfer. So data transfer is well protected by encryption. Memory encryption helps against the theft of a memory such as a, a hard disk, for example. Bring your own key, BYO key, does not help against the cloud provider if the data is in the cloud. Uh, it's not only to be stored, but also processed. So if you aim is to process your data, which should normally be the case. Even bring your own key does not help against your cloud provider. But let me give you a word on this. Please consider the following. If you go into a cloud, you hand over your IT completely, 100% to the cloud provider. That is your well-justified goal. If you let the cleaning woman and or the craftsman into your flat, you hand over the cleaning 
and repair and above all your flat to the cleaning woman and to the craftsman. If you would not trust both of them, you would not let them in. You would not give your IT to a provider you did not trust. That's the case. So why the often heard concerns about the cloud? Back to encryption. This helps at rest and at transport. Encryption helps at rest and at transport, but not at processing. Because there is no continuous so-called homomorphic cryptography yet. At present, the data must be available unencrypted for processing. This means that cryptography cannot intervene here at all. Cryptography encryption has no chance to protect your data because you want to calculate with your data. However, data processing can be protected with the term pseudonymization. So we'll go on to the pseudonymization. This pseudonymization is the three functions which you see here on the, in the legend of the slide. The three functions of pseudonymization, holding the assignment rule, the H, and processing the P, sorry, the C for calculating, sorry, can be divided between one, two, or even three controllers. In my opinion, this division of these three functions will shape completely new business models in the nearest future. If you separate the assignment rule, that is the link between the personal data and the person itself, for example, a customer ID, and in the slide, it is the function H as mentioned. Processing outside the European Economic Area, the EEA, becomes possible and the privacy shield becomes obsolete. It is even possible to keep the assignment rule with the data, for example, in a hardware security model in HSM. This keeps the latency small, which is in some cases, in some scenario should not be too long. This is because the principle from card payment schemes, I told you that I worked for the banks for a long time, can be transferred here. It's called tempo resistance. It's, it's not new, it's about 15 years on the market. And that means if a bank card chip, the chips on your MasterCard, Visa and so on, if the bank card chip notice that it is being attacked, it immediately deletes the stored pin. That's all about this. Applied to our purpose, this means if an HSM notices that it is being attacked, it deletes the allocation rule and the data is anonymized and thus unusable for the attacker. So pseudonymous processing in EEA or in an HSM, which is located outside the EEA, makes the privacy shield obsolete with the help of the of the separation of the three functions uh, of pseudonymization. All TOMS can be implemented on a self-managed and on-premise basis. As you saw with the example of the TOM access control a few slides ago, they are firstly measures that only a cloud can offer. And secondly, these measures in a cloud are already there. You don't have to implement them yourself with a lot of effort. Thus, a well-managed cloud offers, besides the architectural advantages of availability, flexibility, and uh, scalability, a much higher level of security than is possible on-premise. And why is this so? Why it's the case? Cloud providers employ many dedicated resources for security and data protection improvement. Coming back to Microsoft Azure as an example, Microsoft Azure um, within Microsoft Azure 3,500 security experts work on this cloud and Microsoft spends $1 billion a year on security and data protection alone. How do you intend to compete with Azure? But that is not your job either. You have your core business and the cloud can better support you to be successful in your core business and cloud or on-premise is not your core business. On the right, you see the hyperscalers and a European concept. As explained, cryptography and function separated pseudonymization offer all methods for new and secure data processing also outside Europe. Legislators and supervisors are enforcing stricter data protection regulations in Europe and 
in Germany and increase monitoring of data protection violations. In addition, consumer awareness of their data protection is increasing. If only to minimize financial losses from fines and loss of reputation due to data protection violations, industry must ensure that its data protection compliance is maintained. Apart from this, there are good examples of how to gain a competitive advantage by emphasizing data protection. As we have heard, I would say, uh, an hour ago from Mr. Kelber, the Corona warn app only became a success when data protection was guaranteed and users gained confidence that they would remain anonymous. As of the 22nd of September, the app had downloaded over 18, 18 million. I think I do I have to say anything about Apple? I think it's not needable here. So as you can see in the picture on the right, it is a great advantage to see data protection as an integral part and to develop it together with the IT strategy and business strategy and to run into a single comprehensive overall strategy for a company. And the market shows that privacy by strategy can lead to success. So you, you know that privacy by design and privacy by default from Article 25 of the GDPR. Let us, let us come back or let us further develop it to privacy by strategy. Then you, I think that we will gain now then uh, more success with privacy. Core has already published a white paper that happened in June this year on the subject of data protection. And you can find the German and an English version of this white paper at the link provided. Okay, thank you for, thank you very much for the listening and now we can maybe open the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Valnemer, for a, a brilliant presentation. I'm really bringing to life the role of technology as an enabler of greater data protection, data security, and particularly those technologies that we hear a lot about, but actually looking at what they can really mean in action. And great to see you. Hi, thank Hi. you so much. Um, can you see me? Uh, okay. yeah, yes, I can. Let, um, I was about to say loud and clear, but I can see you clearly. So <laughs> hello. Okay. Um, and please remind everybody, if you have a question um, for our, our speaker, please pop it in the chat function. Uh, I don't think I've seen any questions so far, so I'm going to take moderator's um, privilege, if I may, uh, and just ask a question uh, in terms of um, given that technology is an enabler, uh, as you as you outlined, and it can be a really powerful tool, what are the kind of um, questions you are seeing organizers organizations asking? You know, you talked about concerns still about the cloud, maybe other technologies. What are the kind of common challenging questions that people raise around? Well, what what can technology actually do to help? Um, increase our data protection, data privacy, security. What's on businesses' minds right now, perhaps? Yeah, at the time in Germany, I'm an ISO and the DPO at some customers in Germany and in Switzerland. Uh, the first question is how can I come along with the basis requirements of the GDPR? Uh, the basis is um, records of directory, verfahrensverzeichnis, or the deletion. How can I delete my, my data, my personal data? after the, say, how to say it, uh, the retire, yeah, not retired, but how can I delete the process, uh, deleting processes, how can I delete in the cloud in my um, uh, applications? And then, uh, yeah, these are the, the, I would say the basic questions. And I do not hear many obstacles to, for the using of a cloud. I think that a cloud above all it's my customers is, I would say, how to say it, um, a commodity, yeah, something like a commodity. So they are not aware, uh, they are not anxious of using a cloud, but the, the first obstacles to uh, to get confirm to to get confirmed to the uh, to the GDPR. These are the, the um, higher risks or not the, the higher. Um, first obstacles to to get in the flowing to get in, in to get on the move with um, data protection 
Yep. To get going and get on what we sometimes call the journey, the journey of cloud. Journey. and to start, yeah, to start the journey. To start the journey. So and yeah, actually, easier. absolutely. And I actually feel that um, a lot more people have started that journey since we have all started working in this in this new different ways so um this is a great conversation to have um marco schultz um had a question marco wanted to raise around iso 2771 marco the, the floor is yours to ask your question to dr gruzin thank you very much sue and hi valdemar valdemar you were mentioning isms and now with two and a half years of, of gdpr privacy management systems and should be this state of the art way to communicate data privacy concerns into boards much like uh, the CISO is doing it for information security through management systems and, and the most cost-effective ways should be to have integrated management system. Hence, there is a, a, an ISO standard now out for, for a while, 27701, actually, I, I, I have a typo in my chat here. Um, have you seen this uh, populating and, and is there any, any expected acceptance in the market and adoption by now? Oh, okay, I know this standard, of course, and I would say there's phew, no understanding that an ISO 27701 is already uh, available on the market. As I said to the first question of Sue, uh, it's still very hard for the companies. It doesn't matter how big or small they are for the companies to get on the journey to, to start to be simple compliant not confirm compliant to the gdpr with the first steps with uh, um with uh, absolutely needable documents like the records of uh, processing the deletion concept and the tom document think about the tom document and as you know the difference between the 27001 and 27701 there are only two differences uh, in the integration of the risks that the HLS number six and eight and something far, far in the A18 and A17, uh, which, um, which laws you have to incorporate into your risk models and so on. So the differences are from my point of view, very small, but now I'm repeating myself. Uh, firstly, you have to come into the first big points um, and then the transferring of 27001 into 27701 from my point of view is a very easy step a very fast and and cheap step to um uh, to to transmit it or otherwise if you already live um an isms it's not a it's not rocket science to go into the pims anymore very much agree thank you you're welcome Thank you, Marco, for your question. Well, I'm afraid um, I don't see any more questions and we have actually, this time goes so quickly, we have actually run out of time, unfortunately. Oh, so sorry, no, please do not apologize, Dr. Valdemar Gruzin. That was a fascinating presentation and thank you so much for being with us today and for walking us through, um, really bringing to life how these technologies can really be a helper and a, a really key asset and tool to help organizations get data privacy and data security right and align what they need to do with the GDPR. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for being with us. We really Thanks do appreciate it. And as always, I'm sure there would be also a huge round of applause for you if we were in a normal room, but we send it virtually. So many okay. thanks. Thank you so much. Um, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, bye. Brilliant. Thank you. Another wonderful presentation, everybody. And I'm sure you would agree. It's fascinating. But we have more to come. Um, so please stay with us. Um, and I'm loving the, the virtual clapping. So well done, guys. Thank you so much. Um, so we have two more great presentations for you in the deep dive stage today. Next, we're going to hear from Yuri Shususko, and I hope I've said that right, Yuri, apologies if I'm not, software engineer at, at Google talking about differential privacy. Um, and then after Yuri, we have Kurt Kamara from Data Vaccinator, who will be joining us as well. So two more great presentations ahead. Um, so before we kick off, Yuri, just um, if people have joined us again, welcome. Brilliant to have you with us. You've missed two brilliant presentations, but you've got two brilliant ones to go just to if you can 
make sure and obviously Yuri this doesn't apply to you but um, if as Yuri is presenting if everyone could stay on mute please that would be awesome if you have a question um, or a comment please pop it in the chat function or any problems technically let me know as well although you'll be glad to hear Yuri I think the the, the technical gremlins have left us so that's that's awesome um, just be aware that if you're putting something in the chat function your name will be present um, and this meeting is being recorded and when you come to ask a question if you'd like to put your camera on as people have done like Marco just did and said hello that's awesome as well it's great to see everybody so um uh, so I think that's all my housekeeping. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Yuri. Yuri Tshushko, software engineer from Google and a manager of the anonymization team. So a really good link up to what we've just been talking about. Yuri has been actively working on privacy infrastructure for the last six years. So a real expert and is currently developing solutions for rigorous anonymization techniques in general and differential privacy, which I think is Yuri, what you're gonna be talking to us about today. So pleasure to have you with us, welcome. And I will say the floor is yours, over to you. Uh, thanks so much to you for the introduction. Let me quickly present the slides. Perfect, Yuri. All right. Uh, yeah, so again, uh, thanks uh, so much for, for inviting me and thanks for your interest in differential privacy. And um, uh, I think uh, I've been giving a talk for Bitcom as well uh, in, in May about differential privacy and some of you may have seen some parts of this talk. So apologies for the overlap, but there is also some new content. So uh, yeah, so uh, as a concept, uh, differential privacy uh, was, uh, and sorry, just for the moment, can you see the slides? because I can't see them on the screen. Yes, we can see the slides, Yuri. You, you're doing Excellent. good. Excellent. All right. Yeah, so um, uh, as a concept, differential privacy was introduced uh, quite some time ago. It was 15 years ago. Uh, but it took some time to mature and uh, to become practical for the industry to pick this up. And uh, today we'll do a little deep dive into differential privacy and how it is used for a few practical use cases. So. Uh, before, first of all, let's talk about a broader concept called data anonymization. Um, so, uh, and here let's look at one practical example. So across uh, Google services, we leverage user data to personalize and improve our products and make them better for everyone. And uh, of course, uh, while doing so, it's very important to make sure that uh, the privacy of individual users that participate in data sets is respected. Uh, for example, you might have seen this uh, quite popular feature in Google Maps where you can check how busy a particular restaurant or point of interest is uh, by looking on this histogram or bar plot that shows you with busyness times. And uh, what is remarkable here that this data is actually based on uh, actual uh, visits, on actual location, which is, as you, uh, as you um, uh, guess, is, is very sensitive and it's very crucial to protect this data with rigorous anonymization techniques. And this is uh, the core idea behind anonymization. It's something that takes sensitive data and makes it less sensitive, makes it private, and protects privacy of individual uh, users. Uh, this is, of course, very generic, but uh, you know uh, this definition has some uh, some merits. Uh, so specifically, uh, anonymous data reduces uh, privacy and security risks, right? So if we don't store the original data set and only the anonymous copy of this, there is inherently more risk, uh, less risks associated with this. And uh, sometimes anonymization can provide comparable statistical insights. And uh, in some cases, it can uh, even be beneficial to the data utility because it removes some of the collection noise, right? So there is um, always this long tail of distribution where you see some very peculiar outliers to data points. And sometimes we are not even interested in those data points. So in this case, anonymization actually helps uh, achieving better um, uh, data utility. And uh, there, is, um, there is a lot of um, variety in different anonymization techniques and tools. Today, we'll focus on one of the important uh, uh, and the most uh, famous and recently developed uh, technique called differential privacy. But before uh, that, it's, it's, I think it's important to highlight that anonymization is actually hard. It may uh, look deceivingly simple, right? So, um, you know, things like de-identification that have been tried before, things like k-anonymities where we try to group uh, data, data by buckets, 
and um, achieve privacy that way. So uh, many of those techniques have been proven to be ineffective at protecting user privacy in some use cases. So, um, uh, and uh, proper data anonymization is surprisingly very hard. And uh, that's where uh, differential privacy comes into play. So um, differential privacy is a mathematically rigorous way to define anonymization and or data privacy. So when we say privacy, right, wh what do we mean by that? When we say this data is private, um, this, is, this is difficult to quantify. And the goal of differential privacy is exactly that, to attach some mathematical notion, some number to the privacy. So, so that we are able to exactly quantify how private this data set is. And uh, differential privacy has uh, a lot of theory and math behind this. Uh, and But again, the main goal, the main concept is to be able to uh, have a mathematical, tangible definition of privacy. Um, so uh, let's look at one practical example to illustrate what differential privacy is. So coming back to our previous example from Maps, where we uh, build a bar plot of uh, business of restaurants or, or places of interest. And uh, what is uh, important to ensure that when we look on the results uh, on the histograms, we should be able to reveal information about individual users here. Uh, and you see on the left, you see two data sets with only one difference, right? There is one person that was added or removed from the data set. And uh, the key property of differential privacy is that it is impossible with some high probability to uh, infer the presence of a particular person in data set by just looking at the results. Um, so to give a bit more of a fun practical example, let's imagine that you are attending a two-day conference and the moderator shares some insights about the audience, right? And uh, here we see two data sets, blue and orange, blue from the day one and orange from the day two. And you can immediately see that the orange data set has an extra person, right? So it's, um, it's very clear that one person was added. And furthermore, it's clear that this person is actually French. So uh, coming back to our definition of differential privacy, this will not be differentially private. Um, how do we go about that? How do we, how do we uh, publish the data without compromising the privacy of this particular individual. So uh, we will add a little bit of noise to the data set, right? So, and by noise, uh, I mean, uh, we will make the data less accurate. You see this jump in bars, which basically means that we added some normal distributed noise. And what is remarkable here that we can see some insights, right? We can see that Germany has less participants than Switzerland, France has least amount of participants, UK has the largest amount of participants. So these are interesting statistical insights. And the fact that we added noise doesn't you know, prevent us from having those insights. The, the data is still useful, but at the same time, it is more private because we cannot see the extra contribution of one individual. And that's, uh, that's differential privacy in a nutshell. Um, we can add more noise. Right. And the more noise we add, the more privacy we have, obviously, mathematically, but uh, the utility of the data degrades. So um, as you see here, sometimes it's uh, we added more noise and it's not as clear as before that, let's say, I don't know, uh, Germany has less participants in Switzerland because the bars are jumping. So and this is an inherent trade off of differential privacy or even broader. This is a trade off of privacy. The more accurate data we publish, the more data in general we publish, the less private is the outcome. And this, this trade-off is very visible in, in differential privacy definition. All right, uh, so uh, that's all great. And differential privacy is not very complex conceptually. We just add some noise to the data. And of course, this noise has to be carefully calibrated to protect the privacy of the data. For example, if you have a data set of, let's say, income of people and there are outliers that is like a CEO of a big company with big income. So to protect the privacy of these outliers, you need to add noise, which is proportional to the maximum contribution of the um, uh, individual users. So there, is some, uh, there are some subtleties, but conceptually, it's, it's uh, relatively simple. And also, this provides very nice formal mathematical guarantees of what is privacy and how privacy can be quantified. But of course, uh, there is always you know, the devil is in details. And uh, differential privacy is quite difficult in practice. Uh, this is uh, quite tricky to implement. And um, 
the noise, for example, even if we're talking about the noise, the type of noise that is added have to be uh, cryptographically secure and have to uh, uh, have to um, um, be secure against exposing information using, for example, such uh, subtle details as floating point implementation details. So uh, those are the details that are outside of scope of this deep dive, but uh, the key message is that the, those details are very tricky to implement and even to notice that they, are, they exist. And in this regard, uh, differential privacy is somehow similar to cryptography. You know, and there is a, like a slogan that says, please don't roll on your cryptography, right? It's not going to work. Please trust the experts. And this is, uh, to a large extent, is true for differential privacy. Um, all right. So uh, as I mentioned before, even though differential privacy was invented 15 years ago, uh, it is still a relatively young and uh, cutting edge technique, but it is getting more and more momentum. And um, what is remarkable that for the first time in history, the US Census Bureau uh, will be using differential privacy to uh, protect the published results uh, in 2020. And this is really exciting. And this, is, this was a big breakthrough for the field. Uh, of differential privacy. So uh, we also use it at Google, and in fact, we consider differential privacy to be the golden standard of anonymization that we use to protect user data in a number of ways. One example that we have already seen before is the popular times in maps. Uh, and I'm using this example again because it's very easy to explain what's going on here. There is, a, there is um, uh, user data, which is based on actual location history. And there is this bar plot, which should be carefully calibrated not to expose any information about individuals. And this is using differential privacy uh, behind the scenes. Uh, another high profile example of differential privacy uh, that was published recently is a COVID-19 community mobility reports. So the key um, idea of this data set is um, uh, publication of uh, changes in mobility patterns uh, related to lockdown. For example, we can ask questions like, do people go to work more? Do people visit places like parks, groceries, or pharmacies more or less because of the lockdown? And uh, this data set basically allows to provide useful insights into how effective social distance, distance measures are without leaking private information, which is very important. And again, behind the scenes, this data set is using something quite sensitive. This is using actual location history collected from mobile phones. And in this regard, it's very, it is of crucial importance to protect the privacy of individuals when we publish such aggregate insights. And it may seem, you know, aggregate enough, like the, the, this type of data sets, and still it is important to use rigorous mathematical analysis and technique to protect this. And differential privacy allows to make uh, this reasoning possible. Um, Right, so how exactly are we using differential privacy in this particular case in COVID mobility reports? So uh, we count the number of people in a geographic area, let's say uh, Bayern in Germany or Munich or California or United States, we have different levels of granularity there. And let's say we counted there, there are 8,238 uh, uh, people present in particular uh, area, at particular point of time. And then we add noise. Uh, and uh, in this case, noise is, an, uh, is a Laplace noise, well, the type of noise is Laplace, which is typically used for differential privacy. In this case, the randomly generated noise is 79. And uh, we get a differentially private count by summing this. And in this case, instead of 8,238, uh, 8, we publish something slightly different. And what is remarkable that it doesn't, uh, for the purpose of this uh, statistics, it doesn't really matter that um, that uh, the number is slightly different. Uh, but what does matter that this slight additional noise allows to protect uh, privacy of individual contributors here. Uh, how can uh, you use it in particular? So um, as I mentioned before, uh, differential privacy is relatively easy to understand conceptually. It's about adding carefully chosen amount of noise. Um, but there are a lot of implementation subtleties like in cryptography. So starting from 2019 and continuing in 2020, we published a set of differentially private libraries and we open source them. They're available on GitHub. Uh, they're available in three languages, C++, Java, and Go. 
and they provide you APIs which can take all the complexity of differential privacy, or at least most of the complexity. There are still some subtleties that remain on the surface, but most of the complexities are taken care of by, by the libraries, which enables, enables you to leverage the expert um, uh, knowledge and not dive too deep and you know ev eventually come up with a safer implementation of differential privacy. Uh, another remarkable example is machine learning. Right, so machine learning is, is usually a special beast. It's very complex. It's much complex, much more complex than, let's say, bar plots. Bar plots is simple statistics, whereas machine learning is often this kind of black box that does something, right? And there are sophisticated algorithms behind machine learning. But uh, what, what is uh, uh, what is the, of highlight for this slide is that we published a system called TensorFlow Privacy that allows to train machine learning models in a differentially private way. So machine learning is, is a, as any statistical technique, is something that takes sensitive data as an input and produces outputs. And it's important to ensure that there is no uh, leakage of privacy here. And uh, the protocol that we developed called Differential Privacy Stochastic Gradient Descent implemented in TensorFlow Privacy. Uh, this protocol is, um, uh, allows you to train a model in differentially private way. Uh, right, uh, and... Uh, the final slide actually is um, a quick announcement that tomorrow, unfortunately, it's very short notice, I realize, but tomorrow we host a code lab for one of the uh, open source frameworks that I announced before. And uh, during this code lab, my colleague Miraj will explain how to apply um, um, how to apply this framework for a few practical use cases, how to develop your own pipeline that takes uh, sensitive data. Uh, processes that use in different uh, uh, typical statistical algorithms and uh, generates differentially private results. Yeah, unfortunately, it's tomorrow, but still, if you have a chance, I think it's really uh, helpful. Uh, and um, there is a website, there is a link here, but we can also follow up in the chat uh, if you're interested to join. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, thanks everyone for your attention and um, I'm really looking forward to any questions. Brilliant, Yuri. Thank you so much. A, a really interesting approach and it's fascinating the work that you're doing. Um, uh, so thank you so much for walking us through that. Uh, so a reminder to all of you, uh, if you have a question for Yuri, please pop it in the chat function um, and then I can either raise it with Yuri directly or call on you also to um, put it to our speaker yourself. If you would like to do that, please turn your camera on. It's great to see everybody and I'm sure um, that would help with the conversation. But Yuri, we do have one already, which I think is 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 in response to one of the examples you gave a bit earlier um, around, do you think it's acceptable to manipulate statistics by adding noise? And how, how would accurate statistics in the example affect a person's privacy? So I think this would have been um, a bit a bit further back in your presentation. So do you want to, can you kind of maybe talk around that and um, about how the adding noise may I suppose manipulate statistics and how that affects perhaps could have unintended consequences, I suppose, on people's privacy as well, perhaps. Is that is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. And that's that's a very fair question. Uh, adding noise uh, affects utility in the end. So it does affect utility. And in some cases, it may be unacceptable, right? So uh, when we publish a differentially private result, it is of crucial importance to clearly understand how much noise is added and how it affects utility. Uh, and uh, so in some cases, the noise may be large enough not to make the statistics acceptable. And in this case, you know, a publication of actual protocol of the data, right? So we publish differential privacy with these parameters and we added this amount of noise. So this allows the consumers of the statistics to judge whether it's, um, uh, whether this is acceptable or not. But this is a perfectly valid question, right? And uh, just like one comment, it is often the utility, uh, degradation or like the actual amount of noise that we add to protect user privacy is often negligible in comparison to the privacy we get. It is still a factor, right? We still need to consider this, but uh, it's um, it's often in, in practice very negligible. And uh, second question, how would accurate statistics in the example affect the person's privacy, right? So uh, 
Uh, in the example we had before about the conference, right? When we publish uh, two data sets before and after, like day one and day two, we do see that there's an extra person and that person is French. Of course, uh, that doesn't automatically mean that we know, know the name of this person or you know something private about this person, but this does leak information. And if somebody has some auxiliary information, for example, we know that you know there is potentially a person joining the conference, but we don't know yes or no, right? And this publication allows you to make this judgment. Uh, so um, in itself, it may not violate privacy, but with some auxiliary information, which we never know and can't control, this can violate privacy. Thank you. We we had a question touch on this, um, uh, uh, and then before uh, before I perhaps ask Ralph if he'd like to ask his question directly, um, how do you remove the noise to read the accurate data? Or once you've added the noise, do you not remove it? Does the noise stay as part of that data set going forward? Because then I would imagine if you use that data set for other things, that could have an influence on it as uh, in in other contexts or other uses, right? So, do you remove the noise? Can you, or do you leave it in there? The noise, the noise is actually left there. So the da the data set is is made intentionally made a bit less accurate, right? It is a bit le less accurate, and uh, uh, you know, similar to the question from from Ed before, uh, similar to my answer there, we have to be clear about that that we do add noise, but the noise is often negligible, and uh, the noise is not removed later. So the noise is inherent part of this data set. Fascinating. Okay. Um, Ralph, did you want to ask your question or do you want me to raise it? I'm quite happy. Oh, I'm quite happy to raise it then. So Ralph asks, can you apply differential privacy to um, geographical tracking data? Um, so uh, tracking is interesting. Uh, maybe I'm not entirely understand the, the tracking piece in this particular context so it would be useful to, to clarify but uh, in general uh, differential privacy can be uh, applied to geodata right for example location history as we just um, have seen on one practical example of these mobility reports so whenever there is, a, there is a possibility to aggregate data so because differential privacy includes not only addition of the noise but aggregation as a step before so it's aggregation plus uh, addition of the noise to mask their contributions of individual users so for tracking specifically, uh, if you if you need to join multiple uh, traces in particular, right? I don't immediately see, to be honest, I'm not ready to answer this question. I don't immediately see how differential privacy can be applied, right? When you need to, when eventually your um, your output is dependent on contributions of individual users, uh, it is, to my opinion, it is inherently difficult to anonymize this in this case, right? If this is uh, something aggregate, right? In this case, we see that, uh, you know, the trends decreased and people you visit Sparks more. This is possible to anonymize and to get insights for using differential privacy. Uh, if it is somehow about individual contributors, right? And I'm not sure like if this applies to this particular question, geographical tracking data. Uh, I think this is less applicable or not, not applicable in some cases. Thank you, Yuri. Um, I don't think I have any other questions, but we have a bit of time. So while everyone's thinking, if I can use moderator's prerogative and, and ask a question, um, if that's all right, Yuri. Uh, so we at Tech UK, we, we are doing a lot of work around the, the transformative and emerging technologies, particularly data-driven technologies that can really make a difference to our lives and how we all operate and how we all live in this new world, particularly in this new normal. And you've, you've outlined some of that today, so thank you. But it's also important that we get this right from a, not just a data privacy, but an ethical and responsible way in terms of the way that these technologies are developed and used. I just wondered whether you might be able to touch on how or to what extent the more um, not just operational but the ethical issues and the considerations and concerns because we know you know these technologies are very exciting to all of us that's why we're here but um, it can raise concerns as well from a from a not just a legal but an ethical and, and a, an impact on people's lives point of view so I just wondered from a kind of from your perspective how those issues are addressed or considered as you work through what these technologies can do and, and how they're developed um, going forward. Is, is, that, is that something you might be able to just touch on briefly? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's also a bit similar to the question of Ed 
about adding noise, right? Is it possible to manipulate statistics, right? And here, uh, like from the ethical am uh, angle, I think it's important to understand the effects of the processing on the data. And uh, if, if there is a possibility to introduce bias to the data, that is something that may be unacceptable. For example, imagine that, um, uh, you know, the US census, if uh, there was bias to particular, you know, groups of people, uh, because of this manipulation of statistics, right, of adding noise, or because of uh, removing the long tails of distribution, right, if there are some minorities, or there is like a little village somewhere. So it is of crucial importance to understand the effects of um, uh, differential privacy. And uh, I, to my knowledge, US Census uh, is a great example of doing an excellent job in this. I think they have um, published technical reports about this, or will publish. So. And because they use differential privacy and because it's super important to uh, consider the ethical angle and the angle of bi potential biases, I think U.S. Census will be an excellent example of how they tr treat this particular question. But I, I don't know the technical details, unfortunately, what exactly is being done, but I imagine this is about ensuring there is no bias and ensuring that uh, it's about making sure that uh, minority populations are also included in their set and not not cut out by differential privacy or by different thresholding mechanisms but it's a very good question uh, absolutely oh, well well thank you for answering it absolutely i think bias is a, a huge part of of the debate and the discussion we're having now of course has been for a while but particularly given um events of this year has really risen to the front of how from a from a industry point of view how we get that right and um, issues around, of course, transparency and explainability and how we can challenge some of the, the some of the outcomes perhaps that these models are making. But I know from my work and our work at Tech UK how important industry um, are taking this issue and the strides that we're making to make sure that we do get this right as these technologies play much more role in our lives, not just to find out if a restaurant's busy, but but in other ways as well, right? So um, a lot more to come, but I, I think um, it's important that we we bring everyone in, in this conversation, which is why it's so great to have you speaking here today at the Bitcoin Privacy Conference. So thank you. It, it, these conversations are important to bring everybody into and you've really helped us bring us up to speed in, in some really exciting technological developments. So. Thank you so much, Yuri. And as I would say to everybody, thunderous applause for Yuri, please. Absolutely amazing presentation. And um, thank you for being with us today, Yuri. And um, um, pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Um, well, I hope Yuri um, can stick with us, though, for our last presentation of the day. And I'm seeing in the chat, Yuri, absolute thunderous applause for you and very well deserved. So brilliant. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, so our next speaker, and um, we are absolutely dead on time, which um, I'm I'm taking as a huge win today. Uh, we have one more speaker today, um, which is Kurt um, Camarera from um, Data Vaccinator. Kurt, I see you. Hello. Nice to see you. Pleasure to meet you. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. No, it's brilliant. So, Kurt, before we, we kick off um, and I hand over to you to really bring this deep dive um, stage to a close today, um, we uh, uh, just a few housekeeping rules for anybody that's just joined us. Um, so please, uh, if you could stay on mute through Kurt's presentation. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or you have a comment, please pop it in the chat function. And as you see, as we just did with Yuri, I can um, raise it for you or I'll just maybe pop you a message and say, would you, would you like to raise it to Kurt yourself? If you would like to, please turn your camera on. It's great to see um, lots of um, faces and I'm sure Kurt would appreciate uh, uh, the question direct to him if that's the case. But please be aware that your name uh, will be visible in the chat function and this meeting is being recorded and will be shared on the YouTube channel later. Forgive me if you stuck with me for all of this morning. You've heard that about three times. But um, for those of you that have just joined us, welcome. Great to have you with us. Um, and 
uh, I think with that, um, Kurt, if you're ready, I'm going to hand over to Kurt Camerer, who's the CEO of Data Vaccinator and Regify. Uh, Kurt co-founded Data Vaccinator, um, the first open source company for industrialized synonymized uh, data. Uh, he also in 20, oh, that was 2020, apologies, Kurt. In 2070, he co-founded Regify, um, the enabler of a unique networked multi-provider business for trusted communications and collaboration. Uh, and as, in his role as uh, CEO, he's established businesses across Europe and the Asian market. So a real expert to help bring this session to a close, Kurt. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. I don't have a title for your presentation. So what I'm gonna do, it's just hand over to you. So Kurt, the floor is yours um, and please take it away. Thank you, Sue. And uh, just uh, let me give you the title. Uh, the title is uh, Vaccinating Data Against Abuse. And uh, we, as you explained initially, uh, have been in the security space for quite a while as Regify. And uh, we have always worked in this realm of uh, customers that uh, consider their data to be uh, vulnerable all the time and uh, they are uh, vulnerable the data is vulnerable for all the right reasons so uh, when we uh, looked at this vulnerability issue you can approach it from the dlp side the data loss prevention side where you do everything possible in order to uh, make uh, the data uh, as secure as can be, but you can also look at it from the accident side. It's like in road traffic. You have data traffic and the more data traffic you have, the more likely accidents are going to happen. And uh, what the industry doesn't have at this point is what the road industry has developed a long time ago is an airbag. So in case of data accidents you should have an airbag uh, in the industry or to put it in other words you should have a possibility to vaccinate data against abuse and with datavaccinator.com we have exactly uh, tried uh, to start this uh, back in 2019 when uh, vaccines have not been as popular as they are today and uh, so we choose data vaccinator as a name uh, for vaccinating data against abuse and vaccinating data against risks that now you should have the slide again uh, against uh, risks that you uh, see all over the place it's data breaches okay Kurt uh, sorry um just yeah. to pause I we can't see your slides I, d I don't think um I don't know if Leonard maybe you can help Kurt um I can't see his slides um so sorry Kurt, for that no I think you may need to share your screen with us Kurt if that's okay don't worry this is not the worst technological gremlin we've had today. <laughs> At okay. one point, my Zoom completely went and I disappeared. So um, don't worry. And we've got plenty of time, so no panic. Yeah, OK. Better now? No. So uh, let me go next door to people who understand technology better than I do. <laughs> I come back in a second. OK, no problem whatsoever. Well, while Kurt's um, just sorting out his technical issues. I um, hope that um, you're finding the presentations uh, so far really, really interesting. For those beady-eyed of you will notice my Amazon Alexa is now flashing yellow. Yes, that is um, that I am due a delivery. So can we all please keep our fingers and toes crossed that my doorbell doesn't ring because this is now telling me something is on its way. Um, but hopefully we will get there in a minute. Um, so just to remind you as well, when Kurt's presentation has come to an end, um, you can ask questions or please do so during, during his presentation in the chat. And then of course, after today's session, all of the presentations, including the slides that you've seen will be available on the Bitcom YouTube channel. So you'll be able to go back and see if you miss anything or go and watch the presentations again. Uh, but um, it looks like Kurt um, is uh, 
finding his presentation. Um, Kurt, we can now see your slides. Uh, we, you might need to go into sharing mode, but the slides are definitely in front of us. Okay, uh, good to hear. So technical. That looks perfect now. So Kurt, brilliant. Now. Back to you. So it's much better now. Thank you. Uh, so vaccinating data against abuse means uh, approaching risks the way uh, they should be approached uh, before uh, accidents happen is one way of doing it. The other way, and this is the one we have chosen, uh, is to accept the likelihood that accidents do happen, accidents like uh, data breaches, the release of uh, private information, data theft, uh, the criminal style of it, uh, data hacks, uh, can be criminal, it can be just for fun, but in any way it's not what uh, the owner of data uh, wants to go through. Uh, a data leakage, uh, when the system administrator forgets to tick the right box Friday before he leaves or she leaves and leaves data vulnerable for the weekend. Uh, by the end of the day, regulation has kicked in to resolve all of these issues and um, uh, resolving means uh, putting uh, fines against uh, these issues, GDPR being the most uh, exciting of these regulations. Uh, and as we see data-driven business all over the place, uh, we even have data-driven countries. Luxembourg is one of these countries. Uh, then uh, you see that the commercial value of data is clearly on the rise, as can be seen uh, in the stock price valuations uh, of uh, Juris company, for example, Google, uh, and uh, all the other hyperscalers. So data is big business and uh, big data sort of ecosystems are bringing together data in a collaborate, collaborative style uh, in order to make uh, analytics work. Uh, by the end of the day, uh, this new risk scenario uh, is being approached the traditional way. Traditional versus innovative application means on the left hand side, you do have uh, the way traditional applications are being built even today. Uh, that means upon generation of data, everything goes to into one big database. And uh, if you are lucky as a hacker to you walk away uh, with the database or at least parts of it, or you may lose that data in a case of any vulnerability situation. So we think uh, the right uh, way of doing it uh, is on the right hand side. Uh, innovative applications have to start when data is being generated and put the data into a personal identifiable uh, section and put uh, the other part of the data, the content data, into the content section and have it stored in independent databases. As a result of it, you end up with uh, lower value data only if you bring the data together in an application. You have this uh, situation again where you have everything available, but uh, as data is being stored, uh, you do not have it in this high risk uh, scenario. Of course, what you see on the right hand side is not rocket science, it's pseudonymization. And uh, pseudonymization has been around for quite a while, but you have to bring pseudonymization from its uh, opaque traditional project heavy style into an industrialized format. And this is what Data Vaccinator has been uh, using uh, and is using uh, technology-wise. So if you build applications this style, you end up with applications that separate PID from content data. And as a result, uh, you see uh, the risk vectors in green, which means uh, you do have damage control or the airbag built into the way you manage your data. Pseudonymization upon data generation means you have to do it in real time, 
which is opposite to what has been done in traditional pseudonymization tools and projects where uh, you take vulnerable data and make it uh, into less vulnerable one by separating PID and contents. This traditional way, uh, you take a shortcut and uh, to take a data vaccinator and you uh, vaccinate in real time, which means upon generation of data, uh, the, the data is being separated into PID and into uh, the content part thereby eliminating these vulnerabilities at the root and right from the beginning. And uh, of course, you keep it separated during lifetime and you only reunite it upon demand in applications. Uh, if you have the right approach and if you have what we call the minimal footprint approach, then you can, you can take as a software programmer the data vaccinator Lego block and put it into any application, which means uh, building a new application can be done with the data vaccinator uh, module just used by the programmer, but you can also re-engineer legacy applications and uh, change the way data is being stored from this one pot into independent databases. We do have a flexible operating model simply due to the fact that Data Vaccinator is fully open source. So it has a, it, uh, it has a server side, which is AGPL. Uh, it has a client side, which is MIT license. And uh, as a result, uh, you as a user, you can do whatever you want. Uh, if you are uh, a big enough third party, you can do everything by yourself. Uh, the storing, obviously, uh, of the two parts. But we also have customers uh, who say uh, we uh, would like the ID service, the PID service to be provided by a third party. Then this could be a, a third, an independent third party independent from the other party that manages the content side. Here is uh, how uh, pseudonymization uh, data vaccinator style works for local applications. Those of you who understand and have used pseudonymization, it's not new. Pseudonymization is a concept that has been uh, well uh, underway for a couple of decades already, but uh, only theoretically. In practice, there are very few pseudonymization projects that have really made it to uh, maturity and, uh, and uh, breadth of applications, simply for the fact that uh, pseudonymization today uh, is uh, a long process. It's a project heavy one, the tools that do exist uh, do not uh, do the job uh, and the job is to uh, simply uh, how we call it vaccinate at the source which means uh, store into two uh, separate databases and what you do have here is an example rental car application uh, the rental car application fetches uh, the in the data vaccinated database uh, the VID, that is the vaccination ID. And with this vaccination ID, uh, the application upon uh, authorized users only, of course, goes into the content database and uh, fetches the content information. At this point, uh, I would like to explain how uh, important this can be uh, for the medical side. Uh, when we started or before we started Data Vaccinator, we came across a uh, big data incident in Singapore where two years ago uh, the medical database of the country uh, was uh, more or less open. It was a very famous application and the uh, prime minister even announced uh, the most innovative and most secure uh, medical records application in the world and only a couple of weeks later his uh, medical records were on Facebook. So uh, the 
building of the application obviously uh, was not done the way it should have been done by separating both the PID side and the content side. And uh, that example makes clear it's not uh, a big problem if a hacker walks away with the PID site, that is the name uh, and, uh, and the email address of the prime minister, uh, but uh, without the content site, uh, that is uh, his medical record information and MRT or CT scan and uh, the other way around. This uh, way of uh, managing uh, pseudonymized uh, data is not new, as I said, but uh, what we have done it, we have brought it to industrial level and uh, into different uh, usage formats. Uh, the following one is one for web applications where you have uh, a service provider managing uh, the content database and you have another uh, provider managing uh, the PID or in uh, the VID terminology, in the data vaccinated terminology, the VID uh, part of information. We uh, have looked at the necessity of processing uh, because uh, for applications it's important that you can, for example, do a search uh, and not bring the whole database uh, into the application, but uh, a search retrieve the VIDs, uh, request user data, and then display it, as we call it, reunite uh, the two uh, databases in the application, but for the authorized user only. And uh, therefore online searching uh, is a key requirement and you need uh, zero based knowledge mechanisms to make this uh, searching uh, possible on parcel tokens, for example. Yeah, with this, uh, I'm uh, at the end of um, the short presentation uh, of Data Vaccinator and uh, my message to you is uh, vaccinate your data, put uh, the Data Vaccinator module into your apps and uh, uh, yeah, have an airbag uh, built into uh, the, the data of your users and uh, your organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And um, we saw that all very crystal clear. So thank you. Um, so if you do have a question for Kurt or you'd like to ask a question or have a comment, please pop it in the chat function and then I can raise them with Kurt um, directly or ask you to do the same. Uh, we, we don't have any at the moment, Kurt. So I just wanted to ask perhaps a question from, from my side to maybe get us going. Was, um, the organizations and companies that you're talking to about about this approach. Um, where do you suggest people or what are you saying to organizations? Where should they start when they when they if they were to take this approach? What's kind of some of the core kind of first steps or foundations to to getting this right or to to getting the the, the tool that you've developed um, most effective? Where where should people start and think about? It's important to get an understanding about the value of your data first and everything else is going to be a derivative. So you must understand uh, the value uh, of data that you have and uh, then uh, it's a derivative means then you start building it uh, into your architectures. So developing a new application is no big deal. You just uh, take uh, the data vaccinator module from GitHub and you then uh, implement it into uh, your application. We were surprised to get uh, very strong feedback also from organizations which we didn't expect in phase one, like criminal justice, so governmental organizations. Uh, obviously, they have high risk uh, data, uh, the name of the criminal officer and the name of the victim should, uh, should be handled uh, in separate ways from uh, the content of, uh, of the criminal deed. And uh, surprised because normally they wouldn't go uh, to, uh, to a just uh, one year old uh, organization datavaccinator.com 
has been so successful internally that we uh, decided to spin it off, um, spin it off into a separate legal entity, into a company. And uh, yeah, as a result of choosing uh, the open source, source approach, uh, we could see that the trust you normally need to earn over a decade for these organizations to let you in uh, had already been uh, uh, high enough or big enough uh, for them uh, to give us uh, a ring and uh, sit down and discuss uh, what could be done, why there is no dependency, there is no vendor lock-in, and uh, there is no backdoor because uh, they have the source code and can clearly scan each and everything. And uh, that has been uh, quite a, a positive surprise for us. It's fascinating to hear your journey, Kurt, and, and how this is evolving. And it seems like it, it's it's continuing, right? You're only at the beginning of, of, of what this can do. Just perhaps come back to a comment I was struck by a comment that you made at the at the start of your presentation around the analogy of the road traffic accident and there being airbags but there, there not being an airbag in in this kind of area or this kind of industry as yet um uh, why do you think that is why do you think that we we haven't got this right to date or why do you think this is still an issue or still a problem that we're having to deal with and interested given your experience in the industry mm. It's tradition, so uh, people are used to building applications uh, this way, and therefore uh, this is happening at, again and again. So uh, tradition can only be challenged if you come up with uh, something uh, completely new and something uh, as easy uh, to manage as a, as a Lego block. And this Lego block approach uh, has been uh, very helpful also uh, to to take an example which is uh, which is um, which is still a remote one but uh, IoT platforms are are uh, looking at ways of uh, securing the data and uh, managing the data in a in a way uh, which uh, makes data owners uh, today, the data owners of the future. A key uh, challenge of uh, IoT uh, business is that uh, data ends up with the IoT platform, ends up with a third party that may finally walk away uh, with your business. Take the automotive industry. The automotive, automotive industry is highly concerned that by the end of the day, uh, Google's Waymo or some other uh, smart service uh, may be the operating system for each and everything and they are just bending the metal by the end of the day. So data ownership, as it becomes more important, uh, also becomes more important in the sense of IoT. Now, if you had a mechanism to split the uh, information about, for example, a machine, it doesn't have to be a person, the PID in this example is a VID, could be uh, a machine with an ID, with a location. And uh, if you, as the data owner, had the chance to, to simply control uh, these aspects, you could, uh, if you want, only hand over to uh, to your dear supplier uh, with the smart machine, uh, the data that you consider uh, to be uh, not vulnerable for you. Predictive maintenance, maintenance can also work against you if the supplier of your smart machine is smarter than you as an organization. So uh, that gives uh, control back, but uh, what uh, uh, it needs it needs a Lego block. So if you come with a big application with a uh, with a big footprint, you cannot run it in an IoT network. IoT networks, uh, from a performance point of view, uh, would only let you in if you can do Raspberry Pi type of applications. So mm -hmm. on on very low performance computers, this is what data vaccinator can do today. Great. Kurt, thank you so much. Um, we have one question which um, we're running out of time to read off. I'm going to um, 
raises to Kurt as well. So Kurt, just to finish us off in the, in the last minute or two um, before we have to close the session off, because I think you, you've you all earned a, a really, I was about to say a big lunch, but a digital lunch. Um, the question, Kurt, is in the chat, the crucial risk lies in the VID database. What about the security of this database? Where would it be located? Would it fulfill IT security standards such as ISO 27001? Over to uh, you. The obvious answer is yes. <laughs> and uh, as it is open source, take the criminal justice example. Uh, this is an organization that would probably not let uh, any third party run such uh, PID or VID uh, database. They would uh, do it by themselves or have their house supplier uh, and uh, these guys have run through all the certifications in, including ISO 27001. Uh, in uh, other scenarios, uh, we have been asked to run the VID service, which is uh, not a problem because by nature of uh, the encryption protocols that we have developed, uh, we take the service provider out uh, as a knowing third party. So the service provider is just uh, is uh, has just to be trusted on the level of being a good uh, twenty four seven service provider with a high uh, service uh, level availability and uh, not having access to data by nature of a secret that is only owned uh, by the owner of the data uh, makes uh, these services uh, less vulnerable as uh, compared to services that uh, do not have this uh, uh, cryptography uh, basis behind. Great, Kurt, thank you. And I hope Rudolf that has answered your question. Well, I'm afraid, Kurt, thank you so much, but we have sadly come to the end of our time, um, but a brilliant way to end today's deep dive stage. So thank you, Kurt. Um, thunderous, thunderous round of applause from everybody virtually, I'm sure. That was a really fascinating um, a presentation into a, a tool that can that could really help. So thank you. Um, great to have you with us, Kurt. And, and many thanks for your presentation and for answering so many questions. Um, uh, so with that, um, we have unfortunately come to the end of our time together. I hope, like me, you really, really enjoyed the presentations from Kurt, from Yuri, from Valdemir, and from Paul, where we kicked off talking about cloud. Um, just to say now, this session was going to come to an end, but there is much, much more at the conference throughout the afternoon. The Bitcoin Privacy Conference this afternoon will be talking about issues such as data ownership, which we just touched on, third country data transfers, GDPR, um, artificial intelligence and video data, which um, is going to be a fascinating one. And then a big topic, which we've touched on uh, a few times in our session and our time together, global data flows, which I think is going to be on the main stage, which is, of course, a topic that we're all looking at very much right now and seeing where that conversation is going to take us in the direction of travel. So a lot more at the main conference. Um, so, uh, but with this, um, I will end the deep dive stage and allow you all to hopefully go and get some lunch, go and have a, a walk, stretch your legs before the afternoon. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to Lenart, who's done wonderful technical support in the background. Thank you all of you for all your questions and for your interactions with the session. I've, I'm Sue Daly uh, from Tech UK. It's been my pleasure to be your chair and moderator today. And with that, I will wish you all a very happy rest of your Tuesday and bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>